Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I guess it's good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I have to remember that these uh, Rev Up events are not in a specific city anymore, and we're uh, talking to you wherever you might be. Uh, my name is Dan McKinnon. I'm the uh, National Sales Manager for Revisto for Canada. Um, with me today is Brett Suttles, who is our Global uh, Customer Success uh, Director. And uh, I've got a couple of uh, uh, guests that are here to uh, share their Revisto experiences as we move along uh, today. Uh, Federico Pensa from McGill Construction out of Montreal and Claudia Corsatordo. And, we'll, and I have to say it as fast as I can because I've been butchering at every practice that I've had. And she probably cringed as I said it. Claudia is from uh, Diamond Schmidt Architects in Toronto. And uh, today we're going to be focusing on the, the reality of virtual reality in Revisto. And uh, we've, I've, I've been with Revisto for two and a half years now. And over the course of that period of time, I don't think we've done a webinar or presentation on VR. I know we've got a lot of clients that are leveraging it or at a point now with uh, the remote concerns involving COVID. Uh, that are exploring every opportunity that <clears throat> that they have to uh, every opportunity that they have to be able to connect with uh, their project teams remotely and safely. And uh, VR is a tool that will help with that process. So today's agenda. Let's see if my screen responds. There we go. Uh, so today's agenda, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Revisto as an integrated collaboration platform, what that actually means, how our clients are leveraging Revisto to communicate with their project teams. This is the seventh episode of the series that are focused on remote use in Revisto. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about how, how that works. Then we'll talk about virtual reality and Revisto and the specifics related to how we're a bit different than some of the other VR platforms or tools that you might be looking at. Um, or you might have used before. Revisto, the goal ultimately is to bring your whole project team in to work to communicate on your production uh, models. And uh, our access to VR is very much about that. Then we will have our panel discussion with both Claudia and Federico at that time. We'll, they'll talk a little bit about what uh, both their companies have done with Revisto, how they've utilized it, and with how they've uh, explored uh, virtual reality as a component of what of what they've done to communicate with their teams then following <clears throat> excuse me following that uh, brett settles and i will be uh, participating in a VR demonstration. So we're going to showcase the workflow. Brett will be in the headset and I'll be on a, uh, on a shared screen and uh, be uh, exploring that in conjunction with one another and sharing that process with you. And finally, after all of that, we'll uh, address any questions that you have. We have a open Q&A and uh, then following all that, once the recording is all over, we will uh, get into uh, another sneak peek of Revisto 5.0 where Brett is anxious to share what our development team has been working so hard on our most ambitious update today. So with that set, that is our agenda. Uh, let's, let's jump into things here today. Again, I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your schedules to come join us today because this is probably the most social interaction I'm going to get all day, so I appreciate it personally. So with that being said, wh why use an integrated collaboration platform? So the idea with Revisto is that this is the platform, the integrated place where you and your project team can collaborate. And, and anyone who's been into one of our demos, has worked with the software, has seen us before, probably has a good understanding that we bring in projects that can come from Revit, Navisworks, Bentley, Archicad, Tecla, Rhino, SketchUp, so on and so forth. We can bring various awesome tools into a single platform and make them available. So that's not, that, that's not, new, new, not new news, so I'm not going to pound away on that. But th the main thing I'm going to emphasize today, the reason why you would have an integrated collaboration platform in your organization is purely about adoption. It's purely about making sure that all of your best minds, eyes, and experience have access to the same project files that your BIM or your VDC team did have. This is, I, I've been around BIM going back to 2002. Um, there's lots of software applications that do really great things that work in the BIM space. The big difference about Revisto is that 
in 90 minutes I can spend with a superintendent or a principal who doesn't spend time in a BIM application, I can show them how to coordinate with the 2D sheets, the models, related documents, all out of Revisto. And because of the non-destructive environment, the easy to use interface, and the fact that they don't have to sit this as a plug on on top of another BIM application means that they can learn how to use this and their adoption level means that within 90 minutes or two hours, they can have a handle on how to do the major tasks that they need to do inside of Revisto. Most importantly, Revisto lets you take that, take that model that is a representation of your updated product, project model and look at it on a Windows, Mac, or tablet device. Additionally, that's where our VR comes in, is that ability in, to get that updated production model into the hands of the members of your team and then make it available in VR. We recognize that there are a lot of virtual reality tools out there, and there are a few things that kind of set Revisto apart. I don't think we have the same bells and whistles that some of these applications do, but that's not the point. The point is that Revisto is designed to be an integrated collaboration platform. We're trying to give you access to this model in as many ways as you can to be able to access this project and be able to see it even if you can't walk through the project in real life. VR is an added capacity to do that, a capacity to do a virtual walkthrough and do it from your production model. Not You don't need someone else to push another model out. You don't have to have another application to do it. You just use the same application that you're already communicating with your project team on, where your issues are going, your models are going, your sheets are going, and now you can jump into VR. And the, uh, the important part, and you'll see this in the demonstration that Brett and I do today, is that I can hop on the headset. In this case, Brett will be hopping on a headset, and I can go into Revisto on my particular machine, and I can do a camera share with him and see what he is doing, and I can chronicle next steps as we're doing that all in real time and we can do that with a whole production team that's what we'll talk about here today some of that workflow and get into uh, some of the nitty-gritty of working with uh, virtual reality out of Revisto. so with all that said uh where would this will lead to our panel discussion here today so uh basically we're going to have uh, some conversation with federico and claudia related to uh, their Revisto experience and then after that brett and i will uh, have a conversation with them about uh their virtual reality experience what they hope to do with it and so on as we move along here uh so with that being said we'll talk a little bit about where claudia comes from claudia is uh Works at Diamond Schmidt Architects. Diamond Schmidt Architects, for those that don't know, is a is a major uh, design player in the Canadian market with offices in Toronto, Vancouver, and New York. They have leveraged uh, BIM to create some of the most beautiful and spectacular projects that are being done across the world. Um, and I, it's one of those things that uh, I'm, I'm never, I never tire of seeing what, what new project and execution that they're going to perform on it. Uh, we've worked with uh, Diamond Schmidt now for 16 years, and uh, or sorry, since 2016. And uh, during that period of time, um, uh, Gary Watson, who is a who is a member of uh, an associate at the at the firm has uh, had had a, a number of teams come in under projects and has uh, given us an enormous amount of feedback. And they've been very, uh, the feedback they've given us has been very in, integral in how we have developed a lot of our design tools in Revisto. Uh, they've been a, an, obviously an early adopter and an organization that's leveraged uh, Revisto in a lot of different ways, probably different use cases that we had never even anticipated early on, and that gave us a lot of feedback. So you can see that they've made a real commitment over the course of time to use Revisto with 38 active projects right now. And you can see the number of issues, sheets, and attachments, and reports they run. They use Revisto in a lot of ways, but uh, Claudia, as the Director of Design Technologies, came on board in November and had, uh, she had, I've gotten to know Claudia a bit over the last couple of years at the, her previous firm that she worked with, and she had had some experience in working with a, a number of projects in Revisto on 
international projects where she had done collaboration in Revisto. So when she came on board Diamond Schmidt, she was very familiar with uh, with the platform and how it would uh, how it would fit into her vision of what she wanted to do with her uh, design technologies. And uh, we we've seen a, a plan crafted from that. So with that being said, I'm going to turn things over to Claudia a little bit to talk about her Revisto experience and uh, and how Revisto has fit in at Diamond Schmidt. And then we'll take a few minutes to talk to Federico and uh, and start our panel discussion at that point. So Claudia, if you wouldn't mind. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, Diamond Schmidt, as well as myself, have been a fan of Revisto for a number of years. Oh, oh I lost my screen. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm okay. bringing it back right now. <laughs> So, uh, so we've been uh, using Revisto for a number of years, and we always um, start every project with, a, you know, a BIM execution plan. And at that point is when we would introduce uh, the use of Revisto to not only the architectural team but to the uh, larger team, the uh, consultant team. And um, if people within the team, uh, internally or externally, are unfamiliar with uh, with Revisto, we would we would often provide training, we would go through a demo uh, to make sure that everyone's on uh, par with uh, leveraging the tool to its uh, utmost, as well as, you know, coming to, to an understanding about how we're going to work together and collaborate within the, within the platform. So um, always begin that way. Uh, we do a lot of uh, internal training just to, to teach everyone in the office how to use uh, all the tools of, uh, within Revisto, as well as like updates that are that uh, seem to be an improvements to the to the technology. So like like most people, we implemented uh, Revisto to do the issue tracking and collaborate um, in one location. So uh, that's something that, you know, we're always uh, striving towards is, you know, moving away from a lot of fragmented communication via email with snapshots and all of this. Uh, I, you know, really like the idea of uh, uh, keeping everything centralized and transparent for the entire team. So we use it, of course, for issue tracking and coordination. And if uh, the co consultants, for whatever reason, do not uh, use Revisto, we still always um, use it internally. Um, we develop dashboards for each of our projects so that we can see the data, understand where we are with uh, uh, resolving issues. Um, and customize those dashboards and, and the project architect uses them to keep track of progress. Uh, we also uh, use, use it uh, for the actual consultant meetings. So we'll generate reports, um, uh, provide them to the consultant team and then use Revisto in, in the consultant meeting uh, to navigate through the issues uh, and, and resolve um, items as they, they come make design decisions and so forth because it's uh, so easy to navigate. Um, you know, we primarily use uh, Revit as our uh, BIM, BIM authoring tool. Um, it's not always easy to, to uh, work through. So Revisto is a great uh, use case for that. And then um, uh, we, we uh, use Revisto to uh, uh, communicate with our clients. So typically we would prepare very specific uh, viewpoints and then use those viewpoints for discussion. So, uh, you know, it's a much more controlled uh, uh, communication with, with the client group so that, uh, you know, we're talking about very specific locations and we can create issues and do markups right on the spot. Uh, that's been uh, very useful as well. Um, I like to leverage tools to their utmost and uh, try to minimize the, the number of tools and platforms on projects. So when we can, we use Revisto also for uh, field reports and uh, we've been doing that successfully, bringing the iPad out, using the, uh, taking images and creating issues and then generating a report that gets uh, sent back to the construction team. Uh, you know, in this, in this time of COVID, working from home, um, I've been encouraging and uh, developing workflows uh, to encourage uh, the project teams to use their iPads at home and do markups with stylus. That's, you know, sometimes much easier to do than using a mouse uh, faster even uh, because it's all cloud-based, you know, it's very easy to, to um, uh, implement on your iPad or on your computer and the, and the uh, information's all updated. 
So, and then of course, there's Gary Watson. He's, um, uh, you know, the early adopter of Revisto in the office, and he is um, there with his uh, HTC Vive. And that's uh, an image from uh, his weekly um, internal design meetings. And we have a big, uh, you know, TV screen, a, a big computer screen uh, that everyone on the team can see where he's going and what he's looking at. And someone there is like, uh, you know, uh, making issues as, as he walks through the building. So that's essentially how we're using Revisto um, at Diamond Schmidt right now. Are you on mute, Dan? Thanks, Brett. Uh, I was saying that if anyone has any questions, uh, okay. I would not answer them because I'm <laughs> muted. And I just, uh, you guys are just going to have to figure it out for yourself. No, um, I, we, we have uh, questions and answers that we, uh, that we can fit in uh, at the end. So, of course, if you've got anything you want to type in, by all means, uh, please do. And we'll try to make sure that we get to it. Thanks so much, Claudia. You didn't get my thank you for, uh, for that information. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, today we also have Federico from uh, McGill Construction out of Montreal, and uh, McGill has, uh, has been a major player in construction in the Montreal area for a long time and uh, has uh, expanded use over the last uh, couple of, of uh, decades uh, into uh, Ontario and outside of uh, Quebec as well. And uh, as, as uh, is stated on the slide, very uh, has been responsible for the shaping of today's skyline in Montreal in an awful lot of ways. The, the interesting thing about McGill from when I first met Federico and uh, got, uh, I, I first met Federico when he was at a CANBIM event in Montreal. And uh, the amount of commitment that this organization had made to go from an, a, a sort of cursory BIM and digital environment to a very sophisticated innovation in their digital, in their digital practice it is it, it's astounding when I've what I've learned about how far they have come and how much they've done in such a short while and they and the nature of what they're doing digitally to provide a better a better product for their customers to better communicate through the process their their engagement of Revisto aligned very nicely to the other aspects of their digital practice and uh, and it's it's fascinated me as we've moved along here with uh, our relationship with McGill. Now, the, uh, here is, here is uh, Federico, Federico looking all, uh, all, all suave. Uh, you know, this is uh, back in a time when he didn't have to stay uh, at, at working at home uh, with, his, with his wife and his little one. I don't think he's probably <laughs> dressed like that today. Uh, but uh, what, what I'll do, Federico, if you don't mind, is you've got a, a video on your uh, on the, the cardiac center in Montreal here, and I thought I would play that with the audio muted uh, while you talk a little bit about uh, about McGill and the Revisto use and that particular project. If you want, does that sound all right? Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the introduction. Thanks for having me. And most, I'm not. I'm not dressed like that. Most definitely not right now. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, again, thanks for uh, the introduction and hello, hello everybody. Uh, we've been uh, with uh, with Revisto. It has been uh, uh, two years now. We've been uh, investing in BIM and using BIM technology for uh, more than three years now. So back in the days, uh, uh, more than two, two years ago, when we I met with uh, with Dan, we were looking for a uh, for a tool for a, a kind of platform to uh, improve collaboration with uh, all uh, uh, the company we work with. As uh, as a general contractor, uh, we we subcontract most of uh, our uh, uh, job, most of our our, our work. So uh, the uh, external collaboration with uh, with tenth of company, it's uh, it's crucial. It's it's a very central aspect of the of uh, the project management. Um, we're, we're talking about uh, um, several companies per project, and uh, uh, a, a good part of those of companies they they they've been starting using uh, uh, BIM uh, on um, uh, more and more. So yeah, um, 
uh, we've been very, very happy with the Revit. So we try to use uh, uh, and leverage the most of it uh, every day. Uh, our first uh, use of Revit so was about uh, improving collaboration and coordination, uh, mostly mechanical coordination. We've been dealing with the uh, with the first three or four uh, BIM uh, contractually mandated BIM uh, with uh, with three D model. Uh, so we we needed um, a tool for our BIM manager, and uh, Revit has been uh, answering uh, our needs very very well. Uh, but we soon realized uh, uh, that uh, actually uh, there there, uh, there were more there was more uh, in the in the platform than than only uh, uh, coordinate three D coordination. Uh, so first of all, one of the one of the thing that I appreciated the most is the ability to go mobile. Uh, that's something that we've been investing uh, massively uh, since uh, since the beginning of uh, my role as a BIM director. So all our uh, field uh, um, teams they all have been equipped with uh, with the iPads and, uh, and tablet, and uh, the ability, the possibility to use to navigate the three D model uh, directly on site uh, uh, has been proved uh, effect uh, right away. And um, there's been some challenge uh, regarding training and uh, and uh, the need to uh, to ensure a, a switch of mentality. Uh, our superintendent, our uh, safety agent, our coordinator, those all all of the employees, they're great guys with uh, with several years of experience. But they they were uh, most of them they were at the first experience uh, dealing with 3D model. So uh, the usability of Revit is uh, another thing that we appreciated most. Uh, it's uh, relatively easy to use uh, on, a, on an iPad. It's, uh, it's uh, really quick to uh, jump on and uh, use it right away. Uh, particularly, I'd say the, the 2D, 3D integration, that's, that's, uh, that's something that always causes a wow factor during the training. Uh, all those uh, superintendents, uh, 50 years old, 55 years old, that struggling with uh, with new technology, but uh, the, from the moment they see that you're able to jump from a 2D to a 3D, or even better, superpose the 2D contractual document 2Ds uh, with the 3Ds, uh, they immediately want to know more, and they right away they starting using using it. So um, uh, the application they, they went. Uh, um, uh, we, we started using uh, uh, for uh, quality uh, quality uh, insurance uh, safety uh, insurance uh, the following up the the, the advance the, the, the scheduling in the field and uh, yeah uh, I I'd like to mention also the ability to integrate uh, Point Cloud and Lidar that's something that we've been using a lot uh, we we've been uh, uh, we we have uh, our own uh, laser scan so we're using an integrated in uh, in Revit, so that give you the ability to uh, really comp uh, compare the uh, the project, the three D project, to the actual condition. And uh, one of the last tool we we've been uh, implementing uh, it's uh, it has been the the virtual reality. So uh, uh, the topic I'm being uh, I'm here today to discuss. Uh, so uh, I think that cover it all. Uh, Dan, still muted? Sorry, my uh, quick key is not uh, is not unmuting me. Uh, th <laughs> thanks very much, Federico. No, I, I, that's a great segue into the VR conversation here. I thought I put this up on the screen. Uh, we had a question in the in the chat about uh, the devices that we support in uh, in Rubisto, and uh, they're up on the screen now with a picture that McGill ha has kindly shared of uh, the the application being used uh, in the office for VR. So one of the things, if you've met if you've met Federico at an event that McGill uh, that, that McGill is attending, usually he either has a headset on his head or he's putting a headset on somebody who's never had a headset on before. And uh, the VR has been a key part of what uh, of, of uh, one of the differentiators that uh, McGill sort of leads with at these events that makes uh, that that sort of creates a buzz around his uh, his table and brings people to him to learn more about what it is that McGill that McGill does in general. 
So um, you, you've had you've had it now for a while, Federico, and uh, you've been utilizing it. So what what are what are some of the use cases for you of VR? And then we'll get into a back and forth here conversation with all of us. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me first uh, explain to you how we we arrived to use uh, VR the first time. So we we've always been interested in virtual reality as an innovation, as a technology. We we, we, we were interested in, uh, but um, I always consider VR, prior to uh, understand how uh, VR works in, in, in our digital, I always consider VR like a, something complicated to implement. Like we, yeah, we would like to try it out, but we, do we need to buy another software? Do we need to convert our model? Do we need, how, uh, how expensive is the set? Do we need another machine, etc. cetera? So, uh, we we always uh, waited for uh, uh, until uh, one day uh, we realized that there were these tool available in your digital. It's a plug and play, and uh, just cu out of curiosity, I went online to see how how expensive is the set. So we opt for uh, an HTC Vive, and it's actually uh, I think it's uh, right now under five hundred bucks. So it's it's not a big expense for uh, for a company like, like us. So it was actually a no brain for us. Uh, just uh, take the, let's buy the set and perform some tests. So the first thing we used the VR for uh, was uh, out in this uh, salon and conference. Um, there is a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, case, study, case studies here. One it's uh, uh, in conferences with, uh, in, in which uh, the conferences we used to showcase our um, uh, technology advancement and BIMS. So uh, that gives give McGill the opportunity to uh, um, to uh, be noted and uh, and uh, you know provide the wow factor to visitors and, and put us uh, help help us put us on uh, on the map, right? Uh, when our uh, kiosk instead uh, we had the, the a VR set to let people try it out. It it um, at, uh, uh, take take. Uh, um, attention by the participant. In a similar way, uh, another kind of conference we attend is uh, uh, employee salon, so uh, for uh, human resources purposes, and pretty much the same thing. Um, young uh, talent out of school today, they, they want to uh, use technology in, uh, in construction, and as uh, uh, I'm sure it has been uh, in the rest of Canada and North America, uh, the, the search for talents uh, in construction, it's, uh, it's a pretty complicated task. Uh, we, we've been dealing with the uh, shortage, workforce shortage and uh, constant need of uh, more uh, um, educated and technology, uh, uh, technolog technological uh, ab uh, abilities in, in uh, new uh, talent and in new uh, employees. So uh, the, the VR showcase, the VR at these uh, events help us again to uh, uh, recruit and hire the best talents out of schools. Um, after that, uh, so uh, for me, it was uh, a tech VR, a tech which uh, looks great. Uh, but I was asking myself if, if this tech was also useful from a construction management standing point. Uh, not only for the wolf factor with clients or potential uh, uh, potential talents. So we we use it on uh, this contract. We on this project we saw the videos. Uh, it's an hospital, and uh, we were uh, it's um, it's an IDP integrated design, design uh, process. So we were uh, we've been involved in the designing phase uh, when the design was uh, roughly around thirty percent. And uh, and uh, we had the uh, it, it was a, it is a BIM contract and we had the uh, 3D coordination uh, of, uh, we have to uh, coordinate in 3D so all the cells were on board so uh, uh, we went to the to the site during the, one of these uh, mechanical uh, coordination meeting uh, with our laptop and uh, the set and uh, put the set on uh, uh, foreman and coordinators and superintendent ask them. I, we know we know it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a great tech. It's it's impressive, but can you tell us if it can actually help you with your job, with the coordination, with the with the better better com compression understanding of the of the project? And the response was actually pretty great. And we were lucky because uh, a representative from the client was there, and he was really impressed. 
and uh, it require us to uh, provide the VR set to the design team as well. So we continue to use the, the VR in this coordination meeting and uh, it proved uh, very helpful for the team. And uh, we sure that uh, for uh, the next project, the client will be required, uh, either it will be with us or another contractor, but it was pretty happy to. And uh, even if uh, it was in, uh, in this phase, the, 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 the project was pretty advanced by, by then, uh, but it, it, it was pretty helpful uh, nonetheless. But for sure, if we would, next time we would be uh, able to use it right away from the start, from the concept phase, it will be even better uh, from, a, from a, for a coordination, for a design uh, standpoint. That, that, that's awesome. <clears throat> that, that's awesome. Thank, thanks for sharing that, Federico. So, uh, Claudia, it, ba based on some of the things that uh, Federico was just talking about in terms of use cases, you had indicated that uh, in that uh, that last image of Gary sitting in the sit sitting with his headset on, what, the, what kind of feedback have you guys gotten in terms of the involvement of getting VR as part of the way that you can look through your project and do you have some vision of how you guys want to utilize it or use cases you'd like to explore as you're moving forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great story. Um, I've had, uh, you know, very mixed reactions to the, to the virtual reality um, and sometimes kind of a uh, surprise. So I, I run the a Toronto BIM community, which is just a local group. And we had a, a virtual reality event once where, you know, tons of booths and uh, opportunities to, to try VR. And I was actually surprised at how many people at that event still didn't, were still timid to um, put on a headset and, and get into, uh, you know, a virtual space. Um, so at Diamond Schmidt, I think that the um, we see still a little bit of that mixed uh, mixed uh, reaction. You know, people are interested in it, but not everyone's willing to to get right in there. Uh, Gary's great at um, you know uh, trying new things, and he has been using uh, virtual reality with Revisto on his weekly meetings because. Um, it's just that easy. It's not. It doesn't require a lot of setup that some of the other uh, virtual reality uh, software requires. Um, he just likes how simple it is uh, to to get going. It's also quite useful um, in finding things that you might not see when you're uh, looking at it through a computer screen. You know, in that that actual kind of immerse, immersed immersed um, uh, one to one kind of uh, uh, experience. You find. Uh, a lot of you can find a lot of more issues or things scale that isn't quite right that can influence how the design unfolds over time. So uh, that's been our our experience to date. I mean, we're going to buy a new, another headset. We're going to uh, continue to encourage people to try uh, virtual reality in a lot of different ways. Uh, moving forward, I mean, now we're working from home, so it's a little bit different, but uh, that was that has been the plan for uh, the coming months. That's great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that insight. And for those people that haven't haven't looked, I, I put some links in the chat. One is uh, of the Revisto manual link for uh, how to use how to use uh, VR. Also, a, a YouTube video tutorial that we have on uh, using the camera share and and um, and the headset in general. And then I. Uh, after having my conversation with Claudia the other day, I uh, also have shared a link for how you sanitize VR headsets because one of those things in a post-COVID world is your uh, even semi-expensive pieces of equipment that you want to share with other members of your team. You've got to figure out a way to do that. So uh, I've included that link in there. So Brett, uh, do you have any any uh, questions for Federico or Claudia on this before uh, we move into your demo? No, I don't. I think that uh, it's really nice to hear. Uh, well, you first of all, can you hear me, Dan? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. All right. That's my problem, Brett, not yours. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, I, I really don't have any questions. I like where those use cases are going, and I love the fact that we're hearing from uh, you know, someone that's in the design world and someone that's managing out on construction showing that this is actually applicable across the project life cycle. Um, 
you know, I think that one of the questions I would have, and this is, well, this could be for, for both our panelists, and it probably is the only question I have, but, uh, you know, have you guys ever uh, really tried to get any occupational professionals into VR to assist in anything from uh, the way that you design it or modifications to the construction process? And what I mean by that are people like doctors, maintenance professionals, people that are going to have to kind of operate their daily lives on the things that you're constructing and designing for them. Uh, I can uh, I can start. So uh, it's not for uh, my, my my answer is uh, is not yet. Uh, it's something that I I would definitely uh, like to use uh, in case of design build project. Uh, we don't we don't have a design beam uh, design build project which involve BIM right now, but uh, it will definitely something that I will put uh, to the to the service of the team. And uh, we we don't have that kind of control of the hospital project I was talking about, but it's something that we uh, we uh, we discuss with the with the client for future project. Uh, in other way, uh, in a, a, a other in other in other words, we're telling them you should use it for your next project. It's not up to us. We don't have that kind of contractual obligation, but you should use it or or mandate for your next project. So definitely something that I can see the. Uh, the uh, the advantage. Awesome. Yeah, and, and the reason I asked that question is because, you know, when we talk about VR, one of the things we think about is how we can have people experience the space. And I, I just find that to be such a good use case, but I do see that across the industry, it tends to be underutilized. So uh, yeah, not meaning to throw a curveball at either of you, but that was something that very much interested me. Yeah, I think uh, like I'd like to see VR moved up the up the process. So you know we're looking at it as you know kind of post design, you know a, re a review of the design. Um, I'd like to see uh, us using virtual reality to design, and uh, I think that the um, having stakeholders and user groups use leverage the technology as well to test certain things. I mean, the hospitals that we work on are perfect uh, use case for that. We do have uh, quite a number of IPD projects where the owners are, are uh, heavily involved. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, have that start, but we're, we're not quite there yet, but definitely is in the um, roadmap. Awesome. But, but you know, Brett, uh, yeah, thanks. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Federico. If I can add, um, a couple of projects we used uh, VR for coordination, for mechanical coordination. Uh, actually, we're coordinating mechanical rooms, and the the, the superintendent, uh, the, the subs, so contractor superintendent that were there, they used v VR not only to uh, check on coordination. They actually were able to uh, check if uh, a particular control panel or a valve were accessible. So in a way, I, I, I'd say we already test that use, and it's something. Uh, that really uh, it's um, specific to the VR uh, since we, you're, you're able to ensure uh, 3D coordination with uh, with Navi's worker and we can never did so alone. But as you said, the the ability to walk the uh, room, a mechanical room, to uh, actually see the room you know, as, as, as if you were there, they give you the perspective needed to uh, check if uh, if the uh, uh, the access to the, the, uh, the, all the systems uh, are uh, optimal, and if we need to change something, maybe. Yeah, that's. It. I think those are all really valid points, and it's something that we've we've heard the feedback from you know people in an operating room, the getting the getting the doctors, nurses, and specialists in there to see that the equipment is within reach and logically set up next to one another. Things that they may, may not necessarily have seen in a non VR environment. We've seen it with arenas and stadiums related to sight lines and related to uh, the what the, what the end user experience should look like and feel like. And I think that. That, that that is where, especially in the case of Revisto's VR, is not a bells and whistles VR that is uh, about to um, try to uh, hit you with sizzle and and uh, and scorching imagery, but rather legitimate production models that people can get in and say, "Hey, does this work for the intent that it's that it's uh, been designed to do?" So I think all that really uh, lends lends well to that. 
Well, I really want to thank you guys for joining us today and for your feedback on this. I think at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Brett and we'll get on to uh, into a VR session so that people can see it in action. Um, thanks again, uh, Claudia and Federico for your for your input on this. Thank you, uh, Dan. All right. Can everyone see my screen OK? I uh, can. That giant 4K screen with all those tiny, teeny tiny little tiles. Yes. So, <laughs> yes, uh, my, uh, for everyone watching, my computer, uh, my VR station is hooked up uh, in my living room where I use my TV as a monitor to do these things. So uh, you're not going to have this sort of e itsy bitsy user interface whenever you're working on a monitor. So just keep that in mind. But it's something that and most people don't have that many pro most people don't have that many projects either, Brett. That is true. Uh, that is <laughs> true. And heck, I even still got room to scroll. So, um, yeah, what I wanted to talk about is, is I want to start this demo off very, very from a, from a simple standpoint. And then Dan and I will move into some more of the advanced things that we're doing. Uh, first of all, we want to talk about how easy it is to get a Robisto project open in VR. And simply put, the only thing that I did to get the, to this point where I'm operating in the Oculus app, and as you can see right here indicated that I am in the Oculus Revisto app, is I simply click this button instead of this button. So when we talk about plug and play VR, we mean that there is no dead end workflows, there is no preparation, this model is not operating in a silo, Anything that you do in VR, any changes that you dictate, any issues that you raise, um, anything like that is tied directly into the coordination process, whether that's design coordination, design review, construction coordination, or even uh, field applications out with our iPad. And that's one of the things that we like to really focus on is how integrated the VR actually is. Now, once we click on the application and we get to this screen, uh, Revisto is very uniform across all of our mediums. We usually talk about this when we're talking about PC to iPad, but the truth is actually the same for our VR application. So if I wanna open up one of these projects here, all I have to do is double click on that project and it will then open up everything in VR. Now, before we get started in VR, we have a couple different options here. We have the ability, I personally am using uh, the Oculus Rift S. Uh, we also you know, integrate with uh, HTC Vive. And um, so we can use both of those control types. And then we also still have the ability to use a keyboard and a mouse in a VR setting. And I'm gonna talk about why we would even want to do this in a little bit. And then we also have the ability to bring VR to an Xbox controller. And if you've watched any of Travis Outhouse's videos with a certain uh, uh, third party app, you can also do this with PlayStation controllers. And what's interesting about it is, is the PlayStation controller actually has a trackpad built right into the controller. So uh, if you haven't checked out that video from Travis, I would highly suggest doing it because not only can you use that in VR, but you can also use it in uh, meetings where uh, you're looking at a TV screen. So just a little extra tidbit of information. So what I'm gonna do now is, is I'm gonna actually put the headset on and there are gonna be some discrepancies between what I see and what you see. And I, I'm gonna go ahead and point that out. One thing that I wanna point out about the screens like this is that when I'm in VR, I actually see the model. I see the issues and the interface is floating in front of me on a virtual screen. So right now I'm actually standing in the mechanical room and I'm looking at the Xbox controls as they sit in front of my face. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna be able to just basically say, I wanna use the Oculus controller and I'm gonna go ahead and exit out of there. And what you're gonna see now is that I have now came into the virtual reality environment. Now, uh, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down here, and as you can see, we've got a ton of issues in this demo project. This is a project built around 
uh, reality capture. If you notice, I'm in VR and I'm also looking at a point cloud. Uh, this is an actual RCP file. So we are now round tripping reality capture information back into virtual reality. So it's kind of like, you know, reality in virtual reality, if that makes sense. Uh, that's red a whole nother pill or blue hole. pill? Huh? The red pill, the red pill or the blue pill? Exactly. Welcome to the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to hit the B button on my Oculus controller. And that's going to give me access to uh, basically the user interface here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the issue tracker and I'm going to open this up and we're going to look at the issues particular to a VR rev up. Um, I'm going to get back to that uh, navigating those issues here in a second. We're going to talk about some just general navigation. As you can see by, by activating my filter, I have greatly reduced the amount of issues that we see in the project. And I'm really looking at a few different issues here. I'm looking at some markups, some manual markups. Uh, I'm looking at some clash detection issues, both model to model, as well as over there, that issue is actually existing conditions uh, um, conflicting with a flange that we have on this elbow here. But when I'm in the model, as you can see my controllers, I have the ability to strafe around and navigate the project with the left hand, and I'm using my right stick to control where my avatar is actually going. And while you're in VR, you are basically free to look anywhere that you would like in the project. With VR, we also have the ability to retrieve and select items uh, inside of the VR environment. So if I come over here, and I need to get some properties on that handle right there. I can do that and I can look at that in VR, as you can see right here, where I'm looking through these various properties. Or I can even see it on the main interface for anyone that's sharing the screen with me. And Dan and I will get into that in a little bit. Uh, the other thing that we can do is we also can navigate the issues of the project in their proper context. So if I open up the issue tracker, right now what you guys are seeing is, is you are, uh, let me make sure I'm doing this right, you are actually seeing the issue screen of Revisto. And I'm seeing that same exact thing, but what I'm seeing is it's floating in front of my face as I stand in the project. Now, if I come over here and choose 3D, it is now going to navigate me through all of the issues in 3D. So I can now in VR actually witness my 2D overlays happening at real life scale. So what I'm looking at is, is an actual detail of this piece of equipment here in virtual reality. I can see exactly what's going on in the drawings. I get the feel for the space, how big it is, I can retrieve any of the metadata that I want here. Um, okay, so before you say anything else, Brett, just to summarize this, because that's a lot, is that Brett is standing in a VR space that has a point cloud model of the reality captured in here. Additionally, it has a BIM model that's been built to go in the appropriate coordinates inside that point cloud model. Additionally, he has these particular 2D drawings that are properly coordinated to sit as an overlay over the views that he's doing. And he's doing all that in his living room of his house with a headset on. Is that correct, Brett? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is correct. So the thing is, is that we can utilize Revisto VR in many different ways. Um, if you want to get someone in to, to explore the space, you can load it up in uh, a way where you just hand them the controllers and they, they don't need to uh, know how to operate this space, right? So if I jump back to the home view, uh, as we can see right down here, it's gonna take me all the way out to my home view. And, and here, this is where I can just walk around. If I wanna teleport, I can point my pointer over there, hold in the trigger, immediately teleport for that easy that that easy navigation 
Now, if you want to get into an issue tracking workflow and you're not just sticking people into the headset so that they can explore the space, that is where you can either use the keyboard and mouse in VR or you can jump into what we like to refer to as kind of the two-man VR dictation workflow. And um, Dan, if you're ready, I think that we can begin to jump into that. Let's do it. All right, so in many cases, um, a lot of people like to navigate VR and they like to do it with the controllers. Uh, if you wanna create issues in VR, you do have to use a keyboard and mouse right now. But what we see a lot of is we use the camera share so that the person in VR can explore, explain and illustrate the issues to someone that actually records the issues in the live coordination model. This creates a really nice interactive workflow as the person in VR is generating issues that are automatically getting interjected into any sort of design review or coordination process that you have. So what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna open the interface here and we're gonna jump to the uh, 3D interface and we're going to uh, invite Dan in to follow me around. So let me know when you can see everything, Dan. Yep, I'm in your view now. So I am currently looking at what Brett is looking at in the model and he is driving my camera screen right now. Yep, so this is a really, really cool situation where Dan is now viewing what I'm looking at on his screen. Can I point out, I am, I'd like to point out one other thing too, Brett, is that yeah. when, when, we view, when we view this kind of a presentation on Zoom, there's a natural lag that goes with the Zoom uh, or any presentation tool. But when I am being walked through this right now from Brett's perspective, this is smooth as though he were connected to my computer with an HDMI cable. In other words, it's very similar if you come from at all a video game background. M the model's already loaded up in my Revisto and it's loaded up in Brett's Revisto as well. So really all the software is doing is communicating the camera, the camera view and the X, Y, and Z location in the model, whereas the model is all here. So I don't have that kind of lag and I'm getting a real-time interaction as Brett is walking me through this project. Absolutely. Yeah, so th this is a situation where you get a two-man team for review. You know, little details, like some things that may be going up on here are very easily lost in a computer screen, right? Like when I look at this, maybe I can't find an exact answer or an exact problem because we didn't point it out. But I mean, right here, that seems to be an issue, right? We've got the pulley, we've got the chain actuated pulley uh, dealing with this valve right here. And when they go out to install this pulley, they're gonna find themselves up against this existing system right here. So, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to say to Dan, Dan, this is something that was completely missed through design review. It was missed through clash coordination somehow. But now that we're in this interactive environment, we can easily see that. So now what Dan can do is he can begin to create an issue in front of my eyes, letting me know that this is now documented. So Dan, I see you're requesting. Yep. All right, so, so I'm going to give Dan control, and now I can see Dan's avatar moving around in VR. Now, he's not controlling what I'm looking at. I can actually see where he's located uh, with a marker, and I know that you guys can't see this. It's almost something you'd have to experience, but what Dan is now doing is, is he is recording the issue that I found in VR and communicating that to everybody on the team and keep in mind at the same time, uh, he is, uh, all of that is being reported automatically through our reporting system. And I wonder, Dan, should I take the screen again real quick or so well, that they right can see now, how this is working? Yes, for sure. So let me, let me take do. that set off real quick and let me share from my end. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my video. All right, so there's Dan right there. And actually what I need to do, Dan, is make sure that you tag the issue with the, the VR tag that I have. Okay. Otherwise it won't show up. So I can see sure. Dan right there, he's selecting the item. 
what's that under here in the where did you throw that to new so vr if you, if you go to add a tag and you search for vr it should rise right to the top right. or i can take control back and undo my filters either one <laughs> no i'm just uh curious why i'm not seeing it my What's funny about that problem that I pointed out is until this very moment, I didn't even know that it existed. <laughs> so see your VR work is what you get at. The I VR workflow is coming to life in front of our eyes. All right, you're gonna have to accept another uh, stamp there because I'm not seeing your VR stamp here. So. Yeah, so let me take control back. Yep. <laughs> All right, so I got control. All right, so up at the top, we got the VR rev up. So it's under VR presentation. So let's go all users. Well, there we see it right there. It's just mixed in with everything. Gotcha. Yep, so if I go all the way to the top, Oh no. What's the issue number, Dan? Um, I, I can't get at my screen because you are in control of it. Ah, okay. So, uh, so anyway, let's do this. I'm gonna get out of here. And a little bit of a hiccup on our part, I should have told Dan about the tags before that I was planning on using and I did not, so that's my fault. <laughs> but- Well, surprise, surprise. I know. I try to be perfect, but it doesn't always work out. As you can see, Dan has highlighted those issues and there is the issue that Dan created. We can see it over there in the interface and you can see it right there. And now I can see the markup that he provided for me or for the team. And we can always go back and navigate that in 3D or we can even see in VR where exactly this problem exists on any of the drawings that are related. And there you can actually see where that uh, chain actuated valve is is hitting that piece of existing conduit. So and really, it, really it, powerful it, workflows for uh, actually integrating VR into an actual review process with reporting. And, and in, in probably in most cases, you're gonna try something like this. As Brett and I were talking about this earlier as we're setting things up, you know, you probably would set up a stamp or a specific tag for this, for this particular session that you're going to be doing so that the, per, the person or people, you could have camera share with multiple people, but the person typically who's gonna go around and chronicle this in, in conjunction with the VR person driving it is likely to go through and, and stamp these quickly through the course of this and then be able to go and filter those afterwards to add any additional context but that allows them to keep up to speed with somebody walking through the project anything you want to add to that brett yeah i mean you're exactly correct and it was kind of a, a good segue into the more navigation stuff right like i mean clash detection oh look here we've identified these flanges that are that are um you know colliding with this existing conduit it's just a, you know, we, as Dan said, we may not go tool for tool with most VR things, but we do, everything that we do is extremely practical and ties into the overall goal of what you're trying to do with a project and completely included in the package. Yeah, and I think it all it all stems back to being part of an integrated collaboration platform. Anything, any final notes that you want to make on this before we go into questions on this, Brett? No, I, uh, you know, these are really the things that, that I wanted to point out is how it integrates with the project and the different use cases among, you know, occupational professionals, owners, designers, multi-user use cases, um, and, you know, showing that we can, you know, pull in that reality capture, put in those 2D details and give it to you all at scale, um, you know, in a virtual environment. Perfect. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Brett. And yeah, the only question we had was uh, 
was answered directly afterwards that uh, can you interact with the issue tracker in VR? And then I think you showed it literally that within five seconds of that question being asked. So, um, yeah, so again, it, it is the question of the, of the tandem use. I think the thing to, it, it circles back to something Federico said earlier that, uh, that this is an opportunity for you to get into VR without having to custom build a specific model that is going to be used for VR specific purposes, but rather recognizing that the typical workflow in Revisto is that you have this collaboration and coordination model that you're referring to on a regular basis is constantly updated so that when you jump into VR, it's going to relate to the exact same model that you're using for your collaboration and coordination other than that. So, I, you know, I think that that's, that it's the, the sense of the easy aspect of jumping into VR. And I think that like, like Claudia pointed out, I think you're going to find that different people are going to respond to it differently. Some people jump into it and immediately recognize the benefit that it brings to the table in terms of, of showing you a different facet of, uh, of the project and be able to see things like you just pointed out, Brett, in a model that you've been in and out of for all that time, you just saw a problem you hadn't noticed before. And I think that we, we get a lot of that feedback around access points, around being able, someone who's actually able to put their head through a wall or get around an aspect that they would never be able to get above in, in the actual model and see it from that vantage point and understand the issues that might come to maintenance in that after the fact. So with all that said, I hope this is a great introduction into, into Revisto's VR. Um, by all means, if you have more questions about it, you want to you discuss how you can leverage it, please reach out to us. We'd be glad to walk you through that and see if we can add this as another tool in your arsenal of being able to collaborate with your project teams. Uh, we, our final session of this remote BIM uh, se session happens on June 16th, where we will actually be talking about the reality capture workflow. Uh, Mark Jones and I think Brett, you're in that as well, right? Uh, we'll be talking about the specific aspects of dealing with point clouds inside of Revis. So again, one of those key differentiators. And we're finding right now with COVID and restrictions to on-site access that VR and point cloud integration are two things that are really helping people to be able to keep in line with their with their site reviews, even though they can't particularly get to get to that point. Uh, I, again, I want to thank uh, both Claudia and Federico for taking the time to join us today. Uh, both both uh, of these individuals are, are uh, first class people that uh, are heavily involved with the uh, with uh, BIM in Canada and work for two visionary companies. And uh, I'm very very thankful that they had the time to join us today. And I really appreciate them taking time out to share some of their story with us.